Cameron Hank Aaron. Dead at the age of 86. One of the great players, not just of his generation, but of all time. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. I'd like to welcome you to another edition and I'd like to actually have a special shout out to Howard Fredericks because uh, once again, we were on the same <laughs> plane, the same thought. I don't know whether that's good for Howard or not, but uh, you know, each week uh, something happens in, in, in uh, sports. Howard will email me and say, did you see this? Did you see this? And this week, unfortunately, or over the past 10 days, rather, we saw two uh, contemporary players that both Howard and I saw uh, pitch and play in the major leagues. Don Sutton and Hank Aaron pass away. Both are Hall of Famers. Both competed against each other in the NL West. Uh, Don Sutton, of course, a winner of 300 plus games. He had a uh, a great career. I'll argue this, though. He didn't have an immortal career like the player we are going to spend some time with today, and that is uh, Henry Aaron, nicknamed Hammer and Hank Aaron. Uh, he's kind of special for me for a number of reasons. First of all, we'll get into uh, the card collecting uh, part of it, but and I would like to go over uh, the history of him. I've actually had the uh, privilege of, of, of being able to talk about Aaron in the past, and I hope my baseball fans understand uh, where I'm going with this. And of course, I may say something else out of the top of my head, as, as I always try to say, this is just guys uh, or sports fans getting together and talking about either the game of the week or past things, uh, past uh, sporting events and things come to your mind. And you say, oh, yeah, don't you remember this? Hey, do you remember who he played? And then you, you start off. But when I was growing up, Hank Aaron was, without a doubt, it was Aaron Robinson, Clemente, and, of course, Willie Mays. Uh, those were the guys I really brought, uh, were brought up with. Second-tier players were guys like Rose, you know, and maybe uh, Al Kaline. And that is not a slight to either of those players but when you see statistically where I'm going uh, with with the offensive output of the Mays, the Robinsons, and uh, the Aarons and the Clementes, you'll understand where I'm coming from. We've talked about Alc. Do you realize, and of course this is where I'm going off on it, do you realize how many great players we've lost? Uh, I, I actually sent an email uh, to Howard, I, I guess back in September, uh, and I've done some of the cartoons. We lost Whitey Ford, Tom Seaver, Bob Gibson just this year. We've lost Al Kaline and Hank Aaron just this year. Or when I say just this year, in the last 12 months, along with Jimmy Wynn. And I've spoken about how he was one of my favorite players, uh, if not one of the best nicknames growing up, the Toy Cannon. Uh, so we have lost a number of unbelievable great ball players from our generation and Aaron is right up there now as I have probably said in the past and please don't get upset with me just bear with what I'm going to say Aaron and I've mentioned this about Musial and I've mentioned this also with Garrick they were probably three of the greatest but most unappreciated players of all time because all three of them had one thing in common. They were boring because of their consistency. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, and I have said this before, but I was doing the stats for uh, Hank Aaron, and uh, I was telling some of my, my students the other day that you could always pencil in Hank Aaron for 35 home runs, 105 RBIs, and a, or 108 RBIs, you know, right around there, and a 305 batting average. Now, I was going through his stats just to see how close I was because I use Baseball Reference and Baseball Almanac, two tremendous search engines or uh, encyclopedias of the game of baseball. And um, I have a problem with Baseball Reference 
this way. I wish they wouldn't do. They do averages on a 162 game average. Um, so they uh, project what a player would do over 162 games. Problem is Aaron never played 162 games and half of his career for the most part was uh, seasons in which uh, they only played 154. What I like to do is just take the seasons and divide the number. And I find that you're pretty much going to get it. Now with Aaron, Yes, I kind of did this. I took his last three years and his first year, and I kind of combined them. And I guess this is just proving out my averages. Maybe I'm being selfish this way. And I said, well, it comes to about uh, – he, he played over his final three games uh, uh, or the final three seasons. I, I cobbled them together plus his first season. So I was able to get four seasons into two. And basically then I said, all right, instead of 23 seasons, let's just make it uh, 21 with the 755. And when I did that, my averages came to what I always thought he was, 35, 105, 108, and a 305 batting average. Uh, baseball reference has it as 37, 113, and 305. Now I know, all right. Aren't we aren't we nickel diming here and all the rest of it? But my whole point is, when you put those numbers that I have in, it's amazing. During the height of his uh, his career, six or seven stretch, uh, even though he has forty four home runs and he averages over one hundred twenty RBIs, you break it down, and it's pretty close uh, to where I was one hundred eight RBIs and all the rest of it. The only reason being is that he has two crummy seasons in there where he doesn't even come close to 100 RBIs. All right, let's 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 just get into it. First of all, as we're going through it, I just want to show you some of the great baseball cards. You know, Aaron uh, started off in, I believe, the Negro Leagues. He played for a team called the Indianapolis Clowns and then was signed by the Milwaukee Braves. <clears throat> and he spends about uh, from 54 all the way up to 65 with Milwaukee. They fall in love with him, the fans. Who couldn't? They were probably the great teams of the Braves uh, during that time because they win two pennants, uh, 57 and 58. They beat the, the Yankees in the World Series in 57, of which Aaron had a huge part that season with the Braves' success. I, I just want to show you this. I'm not really sure what year this is. I'm not the big baseball uh, card collecting aficionado. I just love them. Uh, I just never made it into uh, my premier hobby. I know this is 72 or 73. I like this one because it shows that Brave logo. I like this one because it has the present uh, Brave logo, and you can see how it's kind of like a retro. They're coming back with the tomahawk and uh, his number, number 44. Uh, this one is definitely from the 50s. I'm going to say like 50s, maybe five. I think it might be 1955. But you can see a different logo for the Braves, all right? His autograph, all the rest of it. This one happens to be one of my favorites. This, to me, embodies the 1960s baseball cards for tops. Uh, this may be early. I think this is like 65 or 66. I used to love these cards, although I never um, collected them. I started collecting about 1969, 1970. My brothers would collect earlier ones, but, you know, they never were obsessed with collecting the entire set. They would look forward, you know, getting whatever loose change we could, uh, going to our neighborhood uh, little shop. It was a great place. Had the baseball cards, uh, little snacks and stuff. They would get them as a treat for getting a haircut or whatever. My mother would say, all right, use the change and you get your baseball cards and, a, you know, candy bar. Uh, life was so simple then. And, you know, it, the fun part of the baseball cards then was you unwrap them in that waxy uh, paper, that smell of the stale <laughs> bubble gum, but it still tasted great. You put that big stick of uh, rectangular pink uh, bubble gum in your mouth. It had a great taste for about all of 10 seconds. Then it 
It tasted like uh, you were chewing rubber, but you would never spit it out, never get rid of it. And of course, the baseball cards always, you could keep them for 50 years. And um, they always seemed to have that smell of the uh, bubblegum. And it was great. It was a sure sign that if summer wasn't here, that it was approaching uh, because you would start collecting maybe April. And uh, it was just fun to see who you would get. And as I said in previous episodes, one year, I guess it was the 70, I got this one guy, Carl, we nicknamed him Lips Taylor. I think I had 19 or 20 of his cards, every pack I was getting. And then finally, I think I got a Ted Savage card. <laughs> finally, I was just like so happy. I got another, uh, uh, there was a guy with the Washington centers. I used to get a lot by the name of uh, Casey Cox. He was a pitcher. I think he lasted like three, four years. And also another one, Jim Schellenbach. For whatever reason, I got a lot of senators, <laughs> but I never got the one I wanted. That was Frank Howard. Um, I'm going to save this one because this is my favorite. Here's a great picture of Hank Aaron. And this one I love because it's the Screaming Brave. Uh, so this is so baseball 1960s. I do like the Brave calligraphy in this uh, during those late 60s. Love those. It was real simple. And, I've, of course, I have to show you this. I didn't have this Braves card, but this is from 1971. Uh, that's when I really, really started collecting. Here's how great it was. That same store I was telling you about, they started, uh, Tops had sent them baseball cards starting in February. Because I remember uh, a February coming home on a Friday where we you're let out of school early because we had miserable weather. It was snowing, there was ice and all the rest of it. And I remember uh, going to the store and getting, my mom let me get about three or four packs to really get started. She was so good to me. And I remember shoveling the snow or whatever was the snow and ice uh, and going in and opening up the cards. I remember getting a Norm Miller baseball card, but this was the uh, 71 baseball cards. And I just remember starting my collection in 70 in 71 uh, in February of that year. And I was like, wow, I guess, I guess spring is right around the corner. These two I have because I, um, this must have been in his last year. This probably was 76. That was the old Milwaukee batting helmet. Of course, they were blue and gold or blue and yellow. This one I love. I love their away uniforms, the Brewers in the 70s. But here's what I love the most. This was quintessential Hank Aaron. Uh, how can anyone not know his batting stance and his idiosyncrasies as he approached the plate, I can recall Aaron at games uh, against the Mets at Shea. They would show them, and he would go up. He never had his helmet on. And, of course, those are the helmets without the ear flap. And Aaron would go to the plate and put the bat next to his leg and then just stand outside the box, kind of like scan everything that was going on on the field. Maybe he was even thinking, all right, where can I place this ball? Because these guys are such great hitters. They can take a ball. I don't care where it is and place it wherever they want. And then he would take that uh, helmet and put it over his baseball cap, his, you know, his regular cloth baseball cap and notch it on there. And then always uh, do it with the, look, the fact that I can remember it, I'm 60 years old. The fact as a nine, 10, 11 year old kid that I can still remember him doing it really had an impact that when you were playing wiffle ball or stick ball or even baseball, you figured if I go up there and I imitate one of the greatest hitters of all time, maybe I'll hit just like him. Well, that doesn't happen, but at least you look good. And everyone knew who you're imitating because he would do that. It was, it was, it was just one of those things that just jump out at you uh, about players. And then of course, uh, quintessential picture of probably the two best stars, at least as hitters, in the National League in the 60s. Now, you may argue Clemente, okay, uh, more of a line drive hitter than power hitter. You might say Stargell, but no. I love Willie. Wait a minute. I love Willie Stargell, but there's no way he's um, on, on this plateau. First of all, he couldn't play defense like these guys could. 
and he couldn't run like these guys could. Could he hit the ball? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the appreciation with Stargell is the later in his career, probably, you, ha you hate to say this, but maybe when he became separated from Clemente, people really, really realized what a great hitter he was as well. It probably came out the wrong way, but unfortunately, when Clemente passed away, I think it allowed uh, really Stargell and his leadership and his star value to really ascend, uh, as horrible that is to say. I mean, but they were two great players, and you can argue at Clemente. Now, the only reason I don't put Robinson here is because by this time, really, Robinson's in the American League causing havoc <laughs> in the American League East with the Orioles. Uh, two great players, uh, both great gold glove winners too. I think though, and, and well, let's get to this. Um, first of all, I just want to do a little shout out for Don Sutton, 324 wins. He was one of these guys. I know a lot of people say he was really more, uh, he amassed stats rather than had, uh, any kind of breakout year. To a certain extent, that's true. But he still played 23 seasons. He played actually on the 66 uh, Dodger team that beat the Orioles. He didn't play in the World Series. I think he got hurt. But then he uh, comes back and really, and and this is why I think it's unfair to Sutton to just say that he was, uh, he, he just amassed statistics and all the rest of it, is that he really was the anchor of those Dodger teams at least their pitching staff, after Drysdale and uh, Koufax leave. So he becomes, it's Sutton and then everybody else. And Sutton had a couple of 20-win seasons. But he, again, you could pretty much pencil in 14 wins every year. Probably would go 14 and 10, 15 and 9, that sort. He was uh, uh, an all-star a number of times. Never really in conversation uh, after the season in terms of a Cy Young uh, he did lead the league in ERA, 210. He had a 2.10 ERA. Yes, people are going to say, well, he pitched in Chavez Ravine, all the rest of it. But you know what? There have been a ton of pitchers in the Dodgers history, many of them good, who didn't win the ERA title. So it's still uh, an accomplishment. I'm sorry to say it's still an accomplishment. And Sutton did win 324 games. So, I, you know, he does last about 23 seasons. Of course, his contemporary, Ryan, about 25 years, also 300 wins. Seaver, 300 wins. Uh, you kind of get uh, that there must be a, a little bit of a connection there. I think if you last 23 years, you must be a pretty good pitcher. He does finish with a, a pretty high war. Uh, I was surprised at that, uh, 66, but he does – he wins the World Series or helps the Dodgers win the World Series in 66. They get back there in 74. They get back there in 77 and 78. He is with the 81 team. Then he goes to Houston and to California and Milwaukee and actually helps in their drives uh, to the postseason. Uh, the funny thing is, I didn't realize this until I was looking at his stats. He does come back to the Dodgers in his uh, last year. And here's the thing with Sutton. He recorded his first win against Houston. And uh, he records his last win. Now, this is uh, his last win was in May. His last season with the Dodgers, 1988. Uh, he does probably help the Dodgers to the 88. I know he didn't pitch, I don't believe, in that World Series. Because I know he didn't pitch in the 61... Yeah, he didn't pitch in the uh, 66 World Series, although he is on the Dodger roster. He doesn't pitch in the 88 World Series, even though he's on the Dodger roster. He pitched postseason 74, 77, 78, 82, and 86. Okay, he does amass a 6-4 and four record, so he was a winner in the postseason. Uh, but in 1988, he actually got his last win in May of 88, and he posted his last loss. Uh, loses to the Cincinnati Reds 6 nothing in August of that year. And I get the feeling, and of course I don't have time to look at it right now, I have a feeling he was probably left off the uh, postseason uh, roster for the Dodgers in 88. But of course he does really get a ring that year. 
So 66 and 88 span 23 seasons. With that, let's span another guy who spanned, ready for this, also 23 seasons. And I just, um, <laughs> when I was compiling this, please understand where I'm going with this. I wish Aaron was able to stay another two years because I absolutely hate it when a guy finishes with like a 299 batting average or 298. I think that's what Mantle finished with. Although I, I did some stats and even if Mantle had left uh, 68 or uh, yeah, if, if he had retired before the 68 season, if you take out those stats, it still doesn't get him over 300. He actually had to leave like two seasons uh, to have his final batting average over three, 300 or better. But anyway, here is Henry Aaron. Um, number of games ready. 3,298. Now, I am going to tell you this. His first hit is recorded against Vic Rashke. His first home run is recorded against Vic Rashke. In Milwaukee in his last year, 1976, he does play on the last day of the year and actually drives in a run. Goes one for three for the Brewers. But really, here's what drives me crazy. I wish the manager had used him a little bit sooner than that. Uh, he does play, I think, like the last 15 or 20 games. Uh, does play uh, more consistently in September because I was going through his last year because I was looking for his last home run. And his last home run is actually hit in July, July 20th, 1976, against Dick Drago of the Kansas City Royals. He would go on uh, and pitch for the Red Sox, especially in the World Series or no, he was in the World Series of 75. But I, he uh, pitched and uh, hit a home run off Dick Drago. That's how I always remember Drago, pitching for the Red Sox. Anyway, he hit his 10th home run in July and doesn't hit another one. He does have several games, uh, his last few years, uh, last few games, where his hits are all doubles. And, in fact, that drives me crazy, too, because he finished with 624 doubles. Please, just one more double. So he finishes with 3,298 games. He could have played two more for an even 3,300. His total plate appearances, ready for this, I wish he had another 59 because he finished with 13,941 total plate appearances. 60 more at-bats. That's basically 20 more games, maybe even 15. Could we have put him in, Del Crandall? Uh, he finished with 12,364 at-bats. Could we have put him in maybe seven more games where he gets five at-bats? Uh, he finished with 2,174 runs, 26 runs shy of 2,200. That kind of drives me crazy. Forget the others. That drives me crazy. He finished with 3,771 hits. Please, 30 more hits. This is what I'm saying. I wish he were he had stayed just one more year because it really wouldn't have affected his batting average. Um, he had 98 triples, and he had 700. The only thing he has kind of like – that okay, okay number is the 755 home runs. Now I'm even saying this: if he had played two more years and maybe gotten 15 homers in each, he would have finished with 800 home runs. See what I'm going with? And then I would have said, "Hey, you know what? If you get up to uh, 800 and your next two are home runs, stop at third. That way you get your two triples for 100 even for your your career." And then this. Um, this was amazing to me with Aaron. He finished with 6,856 6, total bases. He led the league, guys, in total bases. This really jumps out at you. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight times he led in uh, total bases. He even did this for me. In 1959, he had 400 total bases that year to lead the league. I'm not sure whether he led the majors that year, but um, – the reason, and he does have ready for this, he makes me happy with this too. He leads the league with 200 even hits back in 1956. And he does lead the league with a 3 
55 batting it makes me feel good on that too. Anything ending in five or zero, I'm happy with. Uh, so at least he did that for me. But just taking a look at this, and this is what I mean. Um, and then, you know what, I'm going to propose this to you. You tell me which one is his better season. 1957, he plays 151 of 154 games. They do win the pennant that year. They do win the World Series. He has 118 runs scored to lead the league. He has only 27 doubles. The reason I said that the year before, he had 34 to lead the league. He had six triples, 44, 132, 322 batting average, and 369 total bases. Now compare that to the season I thought might be better. But on further review, I'm wondering if it was 57. Because let's just give you the numbers. 1963, at the age of 29, he leads the league in hit uh, in run scored, 121. He has 201 hits as opposed to 198 the year that uh, I was just referring, 1957. He had 201 hits. 29 doubles, four triples, leads the league with 44 home runs with 130 RBIs. Here, you know what I'm going to do? So you guys can see my handsome face all the time instead of my profile. Uh, he had 130 uh, RBIs to lead the league, and he hit 319 with a 586 slugging percentage to lead the league, and an OPS 977, kind of a new uh, stat over the last 20 years. I don't like it, and I'll explain that later. Um, I, I, I just think it's a redundant stat. Uh, and okay. So I'm, I'm thinking about those two seasons. Uh, and I'm saying to myself, which one was really the better year? 326 as opposed to, um, 319. It's kind of a wash 130 to 132, 44 in each. He led the league, by the way, in home runs four times, three times with the same number, 44. That's kind of incredible. Um, but as I'm reviewing it, I'm thinking this. In 57, he wins the MVP, and the Braves do win the World Series. So I guess you would probably have to say that was his greatest season at age 23 age 23 in the major leagues. So I'm just going to recap that. 57, he leads the league in runs scored. He hits 44, 132, and hits 322. The year before he led in uh, the league in batting. He had 369 total bases to lead the league. Of course, he makes the all-star team, and he's the MVP of uh, the National League. Compare that to the one where I really think is the better season, 63, age 29. He has 121 runs scored. He's got 29 doubles, four triples, 44, 130. He hits 319, has a 586 uh, slugging percentage, all right, even though he hit a 600 slugging percentage in that other year. And... Uh, Leads the league in total bases at 370, so a little bit higher, one one base higher. Finished in the MVP running, third. Either way, those are heck of a seasons. And that leads me to the whole MVP for him. Do you realize that Aaron, all right, named, uh, he's up there with the number of all-star selections along with Musial, along with uh, Willie Mays, of course, Hank Aaron. I think Aaron leads in all-time games played, uh, even over Mays. And the reason being is that uh, at one point, and Musial, uh, and at one point uh, they were playing two All-Star games from about 58-59 to about 62-63. So they played in more games, but... They were both named the same number of years. I think also Rose is up there with over 20 selections to the All-Star game as well. 
Ah, you know what? I'm going to throw that out because all three guys I'm talking about, Mays, Aaron, and Rose, yeah, they kind of made the all-star teams in years they shouldn't, more as a, a tribute out of respect for the players and their commitment to the game and their contributions to the game. So, you know what? doesn't matter. Here's what I'm going to go into, though. Ready for this? MVPs. Let's show you another picture. Here's Henry Aaron on the cover of Ebony. Uh, that was, I do believe, the game that he does set uh, the home run record. Of course, he hit it off Al Downing, who was also number 44 for the Dodgers. Uh, did it April 8th, 1974. I kind of remember everything about it. I know that Tom House, he's always, he's really a footnote uh, player in history. I know that he became a pitching coach and had some unorthodox uh, pitching philosophies. But at that point, he was just a uh, newcomer uh, in baseball. He recovered the baseball. I'm so glad he did. Brought it right back. Of course, Dusty Baker was the left fielder who would later join Don Sutton on those Dodger teams of the 70s. But it was a great game. You just knew he, when he came up, I'm telling you, everybody knew in the ballpark. He was just putting it out. And, of course, that whole thing outside of, let's say, uh, off the field uh, prejudices and threats and all the rest of it, baseball was rooting for him. Baseball fans were rooting. Real baseball fans were rooting for Aaron. And, of course, there was also uh, – there were legitimate uh, comparisons between Ruth and Aaron. One is that Aaron – had so many more at bats and all the rest of it. The other was that Ruth spent uh, most uh, a lot of his career as a pitcher and didn't hit and all the rest of it. But many people say, well, Ruth only played in a uh, one color league while and he didn't have the travel that Aaron did, and he wasn't playing night baseball like Aaron was. So there was balances. Bottom line is Aaron broke the record, legitimately broke the record, and. I was telling Howard, again, uh, it was a special night for me watching the game because I was able to stay up. I was 13, and uh, the game was on NBC. It was their first Monday night game of the year, but then they wouldn't show real Monday night games until in June. This was April. I remember doing a poem on Aaron because it was a contest. So I said, oh, we could do it on anything. I'll do it on baseball, and I'll do it on Aaron. And I remember drawing a little picture with it and submitting it. I won third place in the school contest, but I was selected and it was published in my town newspaper. Many years later, I was telling this to Howard, I went back looking for it just for the heck of it. I would, I, would, I just wanted to see what I wrote uh, and I couldn't find it on the microfiche. And today that library, well, it's undergoing all kinds of reconstruction and stuff. So I don't know whether I'd be able to find it. I've tried to look up on internet and all the rest of it. But I just remember he's closing in on a record. And I don't think there was any iambic pentameter. I don't think there was any Dr. Seuss rhyme scheme at all. I was just writing a poem about Hank Aaron. And it won third place and got published. I was like, wow, this is pretty good. But anyway, he hits the home run off Al Downing. A uh, little Al Downing as his thing was going, but he made Ebony Magazine. This one I don't remember, but this is a great picture of uh, Hank Aaron at bat. This one is my favorite cover of all time, and this goes back to 1969, and this is where we're going to start with our MVP. I absolutely – that is one of the coolest – don't ask me why. I just think that is one of the coolest covers SI ever did. He's, he, he's carrying two bats, and he's just carrying them gingerly. I mean, those look like, you know, those are the tools of his trade. Those are the things that he hammers baseball with. Just look at him. And you see, I'm telling you, he's going up to the plate, all right, or warming up. He doesn't have his helmet with him. But this is how he used to approach the plate, and then he had the helmet in this hand, obviously only one bat. In fact, I think pitchers thought him going up with one bat was an unfair advantage for him, and he would just put the thing on. But here's the deal with him. In 69, I have the stats here. i got to put my glasses on real quick, and uh, i got a good five, six minutes to talk about this. Just talking about his MVP, 
and all of the number of statistics that he led the league in. It's incredible. Slugging three times. All right. Uh, RBI, something Mays never did, but I, I'm not picking on Mays here. I'm just saying one, two, three, four times he led the league in RBIs. Do you realize that in his career, he had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He had seven years where he had over 120 RBIs or more. And if he only had two more RBIs in two seasons, uh, in 1970 and 71, he would have had nine years where he had 120 or more. In fact, at age 37, 1971, he hit the most home runs in his career. And he was 47, 118. He hit 327 at the age of 37. And he finished third in the MVP that year. Uh, and that 71 team had a guy from Montclair State. And the name of Earl Williams, who is their catcher. To me, it's someone I uh, have equated Gary Shen Sanchez to. Uh, they both have started out their career uh, really well, hitting bombs. Uh, Williams had 33 home runs in 71, won the uh, Rookie of the Year for the Braves, and then everything went downhill. He was not a very good defensive catcher. He wound up uh, his career with Baltimore as a DH first baseman, that sort of thing. But that year, the Braves had Cepeda, uh, I think he had 25. They had uh, Ralph Gar hitting 353. They were a pretty good team. Not great. They had no pitching. Necro, Pat Jarvis, that was about it. But in 71, he had 47 homers, uh, 118 RBIs, uh, most home runs in his career. And really, I think in 1971 is really where they said, wow, this guy has a shot at Ruth. Because everyone when I was growing up thought it would be Mays. And then that 47 was like the catalyst where Aaron really stepped it up a little bit. And they said, wow, this guy really could legitimately uh, attempt to catch and overtake Ruth on the uh, home run list. Just going through this, though, 1954, he finishes fourth in the rookie of the year. Who's he finished to? Wally Moon, who started out with as a home run hitter, but turned into just a regular player, although he had good company. Banks finished runner-up that year, and in between Banks and Aaron was Gene Conley, who also pitched, I believe, for Milwaukee. Conley, I believe, is the guy who, with uh, with Pumpsy Green, decided to leave the Red Sox one day, and they went to Israel. <laughs> they just got on board, went on a trip to Israel, as the saying goes. I believe it was Gene Conley. Uh, it was the same one. But Aaron finished fourth, albeit he only had a 1.4 war, and it was the lowest of uh, of the four uh, uh, players in contention. 1954, he finishes third in the MVP, even though he actually has a higher uh, war than – or wait a minute, I'm trying to think. 56, pardon me. He finishes with a higher war, 1956, then – the winner, Don Newcomb, but Newcomb won 27 games. See, and here's here's uh, a, a common thread. He's got great years in the years that other guys have great, uh, great or their best years, but they have the play for pennant winners. Perfect example, Don, Don Newcomb wins 27 games for the Dodgers in 56. They win the pennant. They are coming off their World Series championship in 55. So the riders are saying, boom, he's done enough. And maybe Aaron is, is is young. In 57, all right, he wins the MVP in 57, but actually Mays had a higher war, 8.3 to 8. But here's the thing. Aaron's team wins the pennant. And that does, in many respects, I think that it can be a final vote for a particular player in a particular year winning the MVP. Uh, because remember, MVP is not – "Quote unquote best player." Remember, MVP has the a very most valuable player. What does that exactly mean? It's very nuanced, and it can mean one thing to uh, one writer, another to another writer. Okay, uh, so Mays, uh, the Braves win it that year in '58 and '59. Ernie Banks wins the MVP. To this day, Banks had great years. Don't misunderstand me. He was playing shortstop, but the Cubs stink. And in both cases, Aaron finishes third. Once uh, he finishes behind Mays, 
The other time he finishes behind a teammate, Eddie Matthews, a great Hall of Famer too. And you wonder in that year, 59, whether the votes for Matthews take away from Aaron, okay? Uh, but Banks has, to be fair to Ernie Banks, he does have a high war. It's just that he played on lousy teams. He was like the Andre Dawson of 1987. You know, those Cup teams stunk. Then in 1960, here's why he loses. Should never have lost to Dick Grote, statistically speaking, but Grote and the Pirates win the World Series. In 62, he loses out. The two top guys there are Maury Wills and Willie Mays. Uh, they meet in a playoff with the Giants coming out on top. Wills, of course, sets the stolen base record at the time. He wins the MVP. In 67, Orlando Cepeda wins it in one of his premier years. Aaron, though, finishes by far with a higher war, 8.5 to 6.8. Uh, it would have been interesting to see if war had been around back in the 60s and 70s, where Aaron would have placed in those respects and where Mays would have placed in those respects. But again, Cepeda comes over in a trade, helps the Cardinals win not just the pennant but the World Series, wins uh, the MVP. Gibson in 68, kind of hard. He has the 11-9 war. It's far and above anybody else. But he finishes third to Willie McCovey, but he had, I believe, the same war score of 8.1. And here's the deal. McCovey has a, a monster year, 36-105, 293. Here's what Aaron did. He had a crummy year for Aaron, 29-86, 287. Yet he finishes in a tie for war with Willie McCovey having a far, quote-unquote, statistically superior season. This is what I mean about him. McCovey, of course, wins the MVP in 69. But here's the deal. I know that Aaron was hurt a little bit. He finishes behind, but he had an 8-1 uh, war. And really, he probably would have won the MVP had uh, they realized the war then over McCovey because, really, the Giants weren't in uh, – any real playoff contention there. Uh, meanwhile, the Braves win the first NL West crown. And then, of course, uh, really that was it for um, Hank Aaron. But in all those, do you realize that he had higher wars than the MVP in one, two, three, four, oh, uh, five, and I'm going to talk about this one, last one. Ken Boyer wins it in 64, even though, ready for this? His war was a 6-8. Boyer's was a 6-1. Boyer had the career year in his life. Led the National League in RBIs, 119, had 24 home runs. But, of course, the Cardinals win the pennant and the World Series. Here's what Aaron, in a crummy year for Aaron, was 24-95, 328, and still had a higher war than the MVP. Six times he had the higher war than the MVP. And six times he comes up short. But he doesn't come up short here. He is one of the greatest top 10, top five players of all time. On the passing of Hank Aaron, this is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports. Thank you again for joining me. And a special shout out to Howard Fredericks. Always helps me with the production. See you next week.